thanks for being at this session. This is a session in which we're going to try and pull together a lot of the things that have happened over the last three days. I think Neil was the one who said that I and the Focus Zone Chairs and one or two other pivotal players have been keeping an eye on what's been going on and trying to put together a series of statement that's statements that we can consider and debate if necessary this afternoon. So let me outline the context of this session. What we're doing here is we're identifying some pragmatically useful points upon which it might be possible to reach consensus. And we're taking those points out of the proceedings that have gone before and which will be recorded in the conference papers and out of the realms of individual authors and we're taking ownership of them as a forum. That's the difference. A lot of this information will appear in the papers that the authors will provide and the proceedings discussions, but this is where we take ownership of it as a forum so that it is a clearly identified opinion of us. Now you might think that some of these things are a statement of the obvious because you've heard it all. But remember, many of the people who pick up these proceedings and read them were not here, and so this will make it clear what the opinion of the forum was. They weren't here to hear these discussions, so we're being clear about it by running this session. This is not intended to represent all the key points that were raised at the meeting. Not all of the important issues that we discuss can be distilled into simple statements. So please don't be offended if one of your pet issues isn't singled out here. And if we have time at the end, and I doubt that we will, but if we do, we can open the floor for any new points. Now, I want to point out that some important but controversial issues can't be resolved in two hours by the entirely intentional pun of mass debate because they're just too controversial. We could burn out this entire two hours on one issue if we get hooked up on the wrong issue. So I'm going to have to chair this, I wouldn't say aggressively, but I'm going to have to chair it. And so please don't be offended if I steer the discussion away from a particular area or if we stop a discussion and take a vote. We'll come back to how we're going to do that in just a sec. So what I've got is a pre-drafted series of statements which we'll open for discussion. It's much easier to get discussion going and get consensus if you've already got something to argue about rather than generate statements from the floor. What I would ask you to do is keep your commentary brief. If you raise a point that suggests that one of these statements needs to be modified, I'll modify it in real time and we'll, we'll, we'll work like that. I would ask you, if you will, to avoid anecdotes that prove the exception to a particular point if that point is overwhelmingly supported otherwise. Look, this is a very imprecise science. There is always a story that proves the exception to a rule, but those stories are not particularly useful if it is clear that we're going in the right direction. I've already said this, if we're going on too long on any one of the points, I think there's about 16 points to discuss here. We've got two hours, you can do the maths, we haven't got long on each one. Some of them we might not have any discussion, some of them we might have more, but we do have to keep moving. And we're going to measure consensus by a simple show of hands, uh, Jill's led the way on this, and essentially we'll categorise it roughly as follows, so something could be unanimous, you may not object, no one might object. A clear majority would be when only a few people raise their hands in objection. A majority will be when we look out there and it's obvious that there are a few, quite a few objectors, but it's clear that they're outnumbered. And if it came to a point where I'd have to do a count, then we'll just say there's no consensus. We're not gonna do counts, we haven't got enough time for that. So we're being very pragmatic in our approach to this. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna cut out of this mode so that I can edit and you can see what I'm doing. And I haven't arranged these in any particular order, uh, but we're going to start off with some of the points that have just come out of the training session run by Jill. 
So, this is our first statement. The forum recommends that rebreather manufacturers produce carefully designed checklists, which may be written and or electronic, for use in the pre-dive preparation and post-dive management of their rebreathers. Written checklists should be provided in a weather or waterproof form. There's a few elements of that statement which speak to some of the points that were made in the recent session. One gentleman pointed out that you need evidence to, oh no, I'll come back to that actually, I'll come back to that in the next statement. Uh, I think it was Gavin Anthony that pointed out that they have to be weather or waterproof. I think it was Mark who pointed out that we're getting very sophisticated in the way these devices can run these checks for us and we already know there are some rebreathers with electronic checklists, some of them are forced checklists. So this embraces all of those and it doesn't give any extra weight to either one at this stage and I don't think that would be appropriate. We don't have evidence pointing to efficacy of one over the other but this is a plea for the use of checklists. We're going to come back to encouraging checklists and, and creating a culture for them in the next statement. Is there anybody who believes that there's anything wrong with this statement or would like to speak to it? Jill. Yeah, Jill Heinerth here. Could I ask you to add that these be published on the internet and marked with a date revision so that we're clear as to when they are current? Okay. I will wordsmith. The, some of these modifications I'm going to have to make a note form and we'll wordsmith them later. Okay, anything else? Yep. Ken Swain, I would uh, amend pre-dive preparation into two parts. I would call that rather than pre-dive preparation, unit assembly and immediate pre-dive. Break it down into the two parts, one putting the unit together and the other just before you roll in the water. Forget about the spelling, I'll fix that. Yep. Uh, Josh Thornton from Dive Addicts. As far as publishing them on the net, just want to let everyone know, while sitting in this meeting, I got on GoDaddy and purchased basically all versions of Rebreather or CCRChecklist.com. And so we encourage whether we put it together, which we're more than happy to do, or turn that over to whoever it may be, encourage all the manufacturers to supply the checklist to put up on that website. Thank you. Okay, can we take a vote on this? Is there anybody who disagrees with this statement? Okay, thank you. For the record, that statement is unanimously passed. Okay, this second statement speaks to the issue of creating a safety and checklist culture. So the way I've worded it is this. The forum acknowledges the overwhelming evidence demonstrating the efficacy of checklists in preventing errors in medicine. We therefore recommend that training agencies and their instructors embrace the crucial leadership role in fostering a positive safety culture in which the use of checklists by rebreather divers is emphasized. Now I haven't got into details about how training agencies should do this. I think we could spend a lot of time talking about that. I also think that we should trust the training agencies to be sensible and understand the key role that they have. I'm not sure that we need to be more specific about it. Let's open it for discussion. Tom? We, speaking on behalf of INTD, we uh, have a checklist, it's called a pre-safety drill check, that covers not the unit specific, but it covers the things a diver must do before getting in the water. Within 15 minutes of getting in a dive, it's required in every course and it does not allow them to turn gases off or anything else once it's pre-dive checked. It's, it's a multiple step process. Okay. okay. Do you, okay. Right, thank you. Are there any comments around this particular issue about training agencies taking a leadership role in promoting a checklist culture? Uh, you know, and to my way of thinking, that would embrace many of the things that were spoken about in the last session. Instructors, prominent divers, 
being encouraged to be faultless in their own practice and establishing that example for their students. Yes. Yeah, uh, Dale Bledsoe, I, I would only state that instead of saying emphasized, it becomes second nature. In other words, it actually becomes a cultural thing. They don't think about it, it's just done. Uh, emphasize just means you're kind of, at least in my interpretation, is you're just kind of encouraging people to do it. And I think it just has to be uh, part of the whole culture where it just becomes second nature. To so something. you want to strengthen it almost. Exactly. Yeah, okay, I don't have a problem with that, in which the use of checklists by rebreather divers becomes second nature. Uh, I don't have a problem with that wording, and I think it's that's what we're trying to imply by culture. Yep. Uh, Tony Howard, England. Um, I think we also maybe looked, need to look at a bit of consistency across the uh, industry and maybe have some level of coordination between the training agencies so that different agencies aren't promoting a different type of checklist, a different format, or even uh, making sure that there's a minimum standard of what is in the checklist. I think consistency of approach has to be a way of which we promote ourselves as being a very uh, forward-thinking but also a very rigorous organisation. Uh, my sense about that, Tony, I, I don't have a problem with the concept, but each rebreather is different in subtle ways. If I was a rebreather manufacturer, what I would say to you is, leave it to me to create the checklist for my rebreather, and I'll do a good job of that. I don't want to have to try and match what I'm doing exactly with what the manufacturer down the road is doing. Completely agree with that, and that's where it has to be coordinated with the manufacturers. What I'm saying is that many agencies will train on the same rebreather. We should have a consistent approach the way each rebreather is trained upon. Can you outline to me what use that would be to the individual user if the checklist is provided they, by... The well, the individual user may not individually know that the other agencies are dealing with it differently or the same. What I'm saying is that as an industry, we should be consistent, and that if we are then in the future audited by any of the external agencies, like governmental agencies, we need to show that we have a consistent approach to the way we treat How them. would you alter the wording to that? That's a damn good question. I, I, you know, I, I think it's a subtle point. Do you disagree with the fundamental no, intent so. of this statement? No, again, like the gen other gentleman, like in a different way, I'd like yeah. to see it strengthened a certain amount and okay. given a way that we can promote ourselves as being extremely professional in the way we approach things. And How many people think, board. can I have a show of hands, how many people would think I need to modify the statement to in implicate uh, consistency between manufacturers or training agencies? Okay. Neil? Neil Pollock, Duke. Simon, the first sentence makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Yep. The focus of this meeting was not on the medicine side. I understand that. I believe you should take that out and fold in the concept of checklists are important, but not uh, about I'm the happy to take it out. The reason I put it there was we had a representative of the educational profession telling us that in order to drive change, you need an evidence base. Yes, and, but it and wasn't... And we don't have that in diving. No, but it also wasn't presented completely at this meeting, so I think it's a, a little bit... Yep, okay. I'm happy to take that out. Is there anyone in the audience, how many people in the audience would object to me taking the reference to the medicine evidence base out? One or two, but the majority would leave it in. Who would leave it in? No, hang on. I, look, this is not going to be a debate from the floor. If you want to speak, get to the microphone, please. Yep. Simon, uh, Gareth Locke, um, just to change it to say preventing errors in medicine or other environments, including medicine and aviation. Okay, what about, what about preventing errors in parallel fields? That works, absolutely. Everyone happy with that? All right. Uh, is there anybody who would... Do you want to speak to this statement? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, Peter Aquanauts Grenada. I think it should be the manufacturer's checklist to make that clear that we are not dealing with lots of different checklists. And I think second nature should be simply replaced with mandatory. Uh, sorry, which part replaced with mandatory? Uh, that, that, uh, that it becomes mandatory, not the second nature. Uh, mandatory is a strong word, but I'm happy, is, is there any, how many people here would be happy with mandatory? I'm one. How many people would be unhappy with mandatory? 
No, 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 that's not the issue. It's a culture. It's a culture. You can't make anything. We are not a legislating body. We can't make anything mandatory. Richard Walker, Duke. Mandatory does have a legal implication. You okay. may not wish All right. to embark on. Okay. With Richard's comment in mind, how many people are happy to leave it as it is? How many people insist that we change it? We'll leave it as it is. And uh, what was the other suggestion? Oh, removing the... Oh, no, we've done that. We've done that. Yeah. Oh, manufacturers. Uh, yeah, okay. They are going to be manufacturers checklists, aren't they? Is there anybody who disagrees? Okay, Kevin. One of the recommendations is the manufacturers produce checklists. Yes. A lot of training agencies have their own training way of presenting information. Yes. If you define this as a manufacturer's checklist, it may not fit in with the training way of presenting it. Yeah. I, I actually I take that point and I tend to agree with it. Based on Gavin's representation, do you want to say something about this too, Leon? Yes, I would. I, I, I think there's basically room for both philosophies. Generally, you know, I hate to keep going back to the aviation side of the world, but generally the uh, aircraft manufacturer produced procedures, manuals, and checklists for the aircraft. Okay. The operators in an air carrier environment then produce their own operational checklist based on the manufacturer so that there's not a conflict they can go beyond. Yes. Uh, the training agencies are primarily interested in the in-water procedures and so forth, not so much the building of the unit. That's sort of the manufacturer's area. So what way do you want this? I, I would say, for the purpose of a general statement that you're trying to, to reach, you know, perhaps Take the it use out. of manufacturers and, you know, checklist in coordination with the training agency's procedures or some, something, but the manufacturers cannot release the concept of specifying the limitations of the unit in the correct assembly and pretest of the unit. Why don't we take this out and just leave it as Jerry checklist. Wadley Interspace Systems. Is everybody happy if we're not specific about this? Yep, okay. Jeff, do you want to, is there something? I, I was just going to make a general comment on all of these. This is one example of what's going on. We don't want to make it so specific Yep. Tying it to a manufacturer or a training agency yep. or anything else that we stifle innovation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy with that. I think we'll. I think we'll take a vote on this. I think we'll take a vote on this because we're getting into minutiae here. I think the intent of this statement is pretty clear. I don't think there's too much ambiguity about it. Is there anybody who objects to this statement as it is currently written? Okay. For the record, that goes as a unanimously accepted statement. The third statement. And this was generated on the fly during the last discussion. The forum endorses the concept of making minimum rebreather training standards available in the public arena. Now that does not disavow the concerns about legal implications. It's just saying we would like to see it. Is there anyone who wants to speak to that? Neil. Uh, Neil Pollock, can it just be recommends rather than endorses the concept of that's wordy? Uh, it is wordy, yeah, but I think, if, I think if I put recommends in here, I'm going to have a bunch of people probably including Well, let's Tom. find out. What's that? Let's find out. Okay, let me, tell you, let me put it like this then. Thank you for your, your suggestion, Neil. If I leave it as it is, is there anybody who would object to it? If I change it to recommends, is there anybody who would object to it? Yeah, there's a few. So I'm going to leave it wordy, Neil. I know you think I'm a verbose, um, wordy person. Is there anyone in here who, well, I've already taken the vote. Is there anyone who objects to this statement? Good. We, that goes on record as a unanimously accepted statement. Training statement number four. The forum unanimously, and I know the reason I put unanimously is Jill already took the vote, right? I might have to remove the word because I have modified this slightly, but 
The forum unanimously endorses the concept of a currency requirement for rebreather instructors. And when she asked that question, everyone said, yep, that's great. No one put up their hands to object. But then, I think it was Jeff stood up and said, there are concerns. So the forum recommends, recommends, not mandates or anything like that, but recommends that training agencies give consideration to currency standards in respect of diving activity, student numbers, and unit specificity for their instructors. In other words, we're guiding, we're giving guidance to the way we think they should think, the things they should think about, but we're not saying they have to do anything in respect to those things. Jeff, you were the one who raised that concern. Do you want to say anything about that? No, you need, you need to talk to the microphone if you're going to do it. Sorry, mate. Other than the fact that this is a very self-selected group here that are probably much more active than the average recreational dive instructor, and we need not to lose sight of the fact that we've got to keep the entire industry in mind when we're looking at these currency requirements and the safety of everybody and the applicability of what's going on. And, and, and we're leaving it entirely open for the training agencies to do that. And I'm good with the way you've got in, to work. In a sensible way, yeah. The only thing I would like to do with student numbers, say class numbers. Because one, stu one, one, one instructor yeah, may teach point, Tom. Yeah. 10 students, and that one may teach 10 one-student classes. The one teach the one 10 students probably has more teaching experience. Yeah. Tom Mount, INTD. Yeah, first names and surnames, because Kim down here is struggling enough with my New Zealand-Australian hybrid accent, let alone trying to figure out who everybody is. Um, that's strike that from the record about the hybrid bit. Um, <laughs> So, is there anybody who disagrees with this statement as it is currently written? Good. That goes down as a unanimously agreed statement. Now, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background here to the next three slides because they all, we're now we're taking a step back in time, not very far, to the discussion led uh, around accident investigation, and a lot of this comes from David Concannon's presentation. I think we all agree that inadequate accident investigation and consequent lack of accurate data has been a recurrent theme, especially on that first day. And to me and the training zone, the focus zone chairs that I've discussed this with, training small groups of accident investigators from the diving community while of itself, it's not a bad thing at all, it doesn't seem like a plausible solution to the wider problem. Because there's a wide spectrum of potential equipment and having the right person in the right place at the right time is always going to be, we could train everyone in here today to be in a rebreather accident investigation, a rebreather accident occurring somewhere in the world tomorrow, chances are none of us would be anywhere near it. So a more generic solution seems necessary. And I've identified two key points and generated a statement for each one of these points, to deal with each one of these points. One is the immediate aftermath of the accident. So as David pointed out, often people at the site will do the wrong things with the equipment. They'll flick with switches, they'll turn valves on and off, they'll play with mouthpieces, and they won't take notice of the right things. And then the subsequent investigation. So I have two statements, one for each of those situations, the immediate aftermath and the subsequent investigation. Actually, I've got three statements, but both the second two relate to the uh, aftermath, the, um, the subsequent investigation. So here's one that will interest the training agencies. The forum recommends that training agencies provide students with a simple list of instructions that will mitigate errors in evidence preservation commonly made early after a serious incident or a rebreather fatality. Now, we don't have a list, although the sorts of things that would be on that list have been presented at this meeting. Clearly, I don't want to get into a debate about the exact items on that list. This is a concept. But I would take responsibility under the auspices of the UHMS Diving Committee to compile the list in conjunction with the people that presented on it here at this meeting. So how we get to that list is, that's my proposal for that. 
What I'm saying here is that in a rebreather mod one course, there'd be a slide in the, in the course about what happens, what you do if there's an accident when you're present or what you don't do in the immediate aftermath. So I anticipate this could be a little bit more controversial, but I'm interested to hear your views. Tom. My only comment is I think it's a good idea, but I think you have to consider different countries and laws. The third thing you have to consider that generally when an accident is occurred from a legal standpoint, it's considered temporarily as a crime scene. Yep. And so you have to make sure you're abiding by that. And I don't know how we're going to come up with a list that would consider all this. I'm great willing to have our instructors give it. Yep. But I have no idea how you would develop it. Yep. So my sense, Tom, is that this list is not a complex list. It's not, this is just, please don't change, please don't touch the valves, please don't turn off the mouthpiece, please don't flick switches and have a look at what the gauges say, write that down. But don't, yeah, don't interfere. It's more or less going to be don't interfere with the evidence. Yeah, yeah. Richard. Richard Walker, Duke. I wonder if maybe this would be better put on the manufacturers than the training agencies with the protocol to be to contact the manufacturer for specific instructions. We're going to come back to that. We're coming to that next. This is when you first get out of the water, Richard. You know what happens. You know, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. people interfere with stuff before, right. before they contact anybody. The manufacturers aren't going to be there. Does it need to be anything other than don't touch anything? Then, because really, the, the, my one concern is that that in, inherently makes the other rebreather diver subject to all the discovery and legal and testimony, and now they're caring for evidence and there's a chain of command for that and, and custody and I think I think I think you're getting the sense that this is going to be a protocol for a rebreather accident investigation it is not it is just going to be a few key points of advice that you could fit onto a single slide that say don't do this don't do this don't do this these are the obvious errors you could make and the next slide is going to be to getting on to contacting someone who can help you with the right advice straight away Okay, I, I was just concerned when you said writing down pressures and things like that, that you were stepping from that role of I'm, mess I'm, with it. I'm shooting from the hip here. Data. I, we would take Mr. Con Cannon's advice in compiling this list. Right, right obviously, and I'm on the committee with you, so I'm yeah. to help out. But you can, yeah, you'll be a great help. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Let's go over to this side, Gavin. Uh, Gavin Anthony, I agree fully with the first paragraph and statement. Yep. Um, I got some concerns with the amorphous aspect of who will develop this. Yep. Um, I think you do need to make sure you've got input from manufacturers. You do need to know that you've got input from people who are going to receive this kit to look at. Um, and so it, it's, it's how amorphous the second sentence, second okay. part of it is. That's my concern um, here. I would be happy to take that away. The only problem then is... We haven't actually put it down as an action item for anyone. So I don't quite know how to deal with that. Uh, what, I'm what I'm asking is for you guys to trust us to talk to the right people. I mean, that's what the UHMS Diving Committee is for. We wouldn't do it unilaterally. Okay. I mean, to help you, um, I have one that's been agreed within the UK from regulatory bodies, ourselves, right. etc. So I can give you a template. Um, That'd be great. That'd be fantastic. Okay. I, I, I'm asking for a bit of trust here. I, don't worry, I'm not going to sit down and write this down on the plane on the way home. Uh, and this next speaker would be a big part of developing it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Steve Sellers. Uh, I would uh, recommend that we replace the word rebreather with diving. All right? To, to address the situation where we de might be dealing with mixed teams or whatever. Yeah, I accept that. Then the list would be different, I think. And we are... I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, and, and we, we, the other thing there too, we would be, we would therefore be recommending to training agents who, tra training agencies who train all divers, such as Paddy, training their open water divers, to do the same thing. And I'm not sure that Paddy would want to have a slide like that in their open water <laughs> diving course. To be honest, I'm not sure we'd get compliance from them. Well, well but, but I think you've covered that with your with your terminology. Provide them with a simple. Yeah, but I still don't know that it's something that the training agencies would cooperate with if we tried to put it into mainstream diving. I, I hear you, but this is a rebreather forum. I'd prefer to leave it as it is. I mean, is there anyone... Okay, let me do a show of hands. I mean, who would like me to try and open this up to the entire diving industry? 
Any other people in support of that? Is it? I didn't see it in the Paddy Up and Water course. Yeah, Paddy Rescue Diver course. Yeah. Yeah. Is it who thinks that we should take this from the rebreather realm to the mainstream diving realm? Put up their hands. Okay, we'll leave it as it is. Yep, David. Hi, uh, Simon David Concannon. Uh, I agree with Tom Mount. I think that this is a, a good idea, and I, I can you speak a bit closer to the microphone? Sorry please? about that, David Concannon. I agree with Tom Mount that uh, this is a good idea. I like the emphasis, particularly on simple list. Yeah. And uh, the simpler, the better. And I don't think it can hurt anything, frankly. Okay. So, Thank I think you. It'd be helpful. Thank you for that. So we have a legal opinion. Uh, I'm going to take one more comment and then we're going to cut discussion. Actually, I'll take these two comments. That'll be it. Yep. I think that we should emphasize that because we produce, I'm sorry, Michael Pizzio, because we produce a simple list does not mean that the other divers on the scene should any way be involved in actioning that list. I would suggest that we produce a list as a resource to first responding officers could then action that. We're going to come Diver. to that in the next slide, okay. I promise you. Sorry. This is just to stop <clears throat> divers making mistakes. Right, but my point is the divers, other divers on the boat, regardless of their uh, certification status, should not be interfering with the evidence. Oh, no, I totally agree. Okay. That, that's, that's more or less what it's going to say. And I think the message we got from David on the first day was that divers are interfering with the evidence. And that's what we've got to try and stop them from doing. One last comment. Uh, Grant Graves, Cambrian Foundation. Um, my only issue is with students. Which students are we talking about entry level? Because if we're going to start teaching people from scratch on closed circuit, we don't give this information on open circuit to anybody but pros or rescue divers. Entry level rebreather students. Uh, yeah, I'm questioning why would it be entry level? Shouldn't it be a different level or pros or supervisor entry staff? Level. Okay. Entry level. Well, hang on, hang on. Th these, are the these are students having their first interaction with a rebreather training agency. So they're entry level students, aren't they? Tony? Uh, actually, actually, look, I really want to close this discussion. Yeah, I just want to comment actually. Um, Speaking to the microphone quickly, and give us your name. If, I, think you should, I think we should remove entry level because you could have divers who have been mod one for a long time, never done this, go to a mod two, then you can actually bring them up to speed on it. Okay. Okay. I think that's reasonable too, so I'm going to remove entry level and just put rebreather students because it can be in all the courses. Yeah, Gavin? Can, can you take it one step? Rebreather students and existing divers. Well, how would the training agencies get the message well, out to them? Okay, I'll procure. This is the BSAC. We're a big club, 30,000 people. You know, there's a lot of people who are already trained. They need this information as well. Okay. Uh, so, so hang on. I'm going to put, I'm going to, uh, so, so what I'm going to do, Gavin, is I'm going to put that as a footnote uh, to recommend distribution to existing divers via uh, clubs, etc., where possible. Simon, quick, quick suggestion, just divers instead of rebreather students, rebreather divers might cover that. Rebreather divers, yeah. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, I'm going to vote on this statement. Is there anybody who now disagrees with this statement? Okay, that statement is carried unanimously for the record. Thank you. Okay, now this is where, so I'm sorry to have sort of blown away that previous speaker who was kind of talking about the accident investigation. We, we're kind of moving into this now. So this statement reads, the forum endorses the concept of a widely notified, in other words, people know about it, centralized on-call consultation service to help investigators in avoiding errors or omissions in the early stages of a rebreather accident investigation and to facilitate referral to expert investigative services. This could be achieved via DAN or equivalents in different countries and different places in the world in conjunction with or a dedicated website. The point here is, everybody knows, everyone in this room knows, if they go diving tomorrow and get decompression sickness here in Florida, they'll ring Dan, right? That's what you do, you ring Dan. If we know that when you have a rebreather accident and you, and you want to get an investigation going, it needs to be dealt with properly, that you also ring Dan, and the Dan person knows which website to refer you to 
or which person to contact, then you've solved the problem of needing to have experts present in every single rebreather accident situation. You need a centralized referral service. Now, I think this is a, pra this is a pragmatic solution to the problem, but I'd be very interested in hearing from someone from Dan here who may want to comment on it. I mean, is it reasonable to have a sheet of paper at the Dan phone saying, if someone calls and says they have a rebreather accident on their hands, this is what you tell them to do. What do you think, Neil? Neil Pollock, yes. E easy. I mean, with the incident database we're doing, this is very logical. Okay. Thank you. Gavin. Sorry to be a jack-in-the-box here. No, As no. somebody who does all too many investigations, I've often been presented with rebreathers where people have been given expert advice already, and it's made my job an absolute nightmare. So I agree with the principle but I'm worried that when it gets to the expert investigation services, that they receive something which something's been done to that no, shouldn't that, that, occur. That's exactly the point. So someone has an accident in the UK. I don't know what phone you have there. You have a Dan phone or a... So they say, don't touch it. You can look it up on the site, but I'm going to put you in touch with Gavin Anthony at Kinetic, and he's going to tell you what to do with this rebreather, and don't do anything until you've spoken to him. The policeman on the site rings the Dan phone and says, I've got a rebreather accident. The person on the end of the Dan phone says, you need to talk to Gavin Anthony, you need to talk to Kinetic. That's the whole point I, I of think this. Provided it, it comes over in that manner. To the right, yeah. That, that's not quite that, how I saw That's the it. whole intent of what I'm saying here. Peter. Just to confirm that that's just the principle of operation here. Dan would have a referral list. Dan would not qualify uh, experts but compile the list of experts thanks to your input, and that would be ready. ready yeah, yeah. well, ref referral to expert inve investigative services implies that this centralized on-call service will have the right names to provide. Absolutely. And this is trying to get around the I got a guy thing that David Concanon was bringing up. Nick? Thank you. You called me out. I, this is Nick Bird from Dan. I'm actually going to go a little bit against my colleagues on this one as the guy who oversees the medical services call center and for a few very simple reasons. For me to provide medical information, I can do that. If I provide you more information, I start practicing medicine over the phone for somebody who I do not have a doctor-patient relationship with and that puts us in significant hock. That's not good. How, how is this medical I, advice? I'm just, I'm just giving a context. Right. If I all of a sudden start providing some medical or le medical legal advice, i.e. you've got an accident, are you asking me about an injured person? For which I can say, you know what, it sounds like you should go to the emergency room mm -hmm. versus I've got a guy, which I realize that we have a, it, do you want me to create that list of approved people? No. Do you want Dan to be responsible for creating and maintaining that list for that industry? That puts a burden on Dan that we really shouldn't get into. If you, uh, I, no, so I hear what you're saying, Nick. That's kind of why I've got the word concept underlined there. This is an idea for getting around a problem that seems to me to be otherwise unsolvable. Now, whether that central referral source ends up being Dan or just a website, I don't really care. But the concept of centrali a centralized resource is what I'm getting at here. It doesn't have to be Dan. It could be achieved via Dan or equivalents and or a dedicated website. Well, I'm not committing Dan to anything here. The, the other part about this is I'm also sort of speaking from conversations I've had with our board who get very nervous about Dan being in any kind of way a legal referral service. Okay. So I just put that out. Thank cool. you. Um, Harry, do you have something to say? Uh, Richard Harris. Um, as one of the doctors who answers the Dan emergency helpline in the Asia Pacific region, if Dan, uh, the overseer of, of this telephone service, agrees that this is something that would work and is safe for them legally, then I think it would be an excellent um, uh, resource. And uh, you know, because people just, as you said, people know that Dan's the person that they call, and uh, it's an ex excellent central resource and it would work very well in my opinion. And as one of the people who picks up the phone, I'd be happy to give that kind of very simple advice. These are the people you need to talk to. 
Okay. Nothing more specific. Okay. All right. So, so Sorry, Nick. Simon. This is Nick Bird again. Uh, one other issue is that oftentimes we do not hear about fatalities or accidents for some time. Well, my, my concept here is that you would hear about it because people would know to call you if you were the person that that ultimately, if, if it was something that Dan decided to take on, but Dan may not, Dan may just decide to host a page on their website, or someone else may decide to host a page on their website. I'm, right. I'm, what I'm asking for here is an endorsement of the concept of a centralized resource. And, and, in, and in theory, I don't disagree with the concept. Where I'm, I'm trying to get down to an operational pragmatism, yep. which is that um, it is very difficult for us to ever, People know that Dan takes accident fatality information yep. and has done for the last 20 years. Yep. We still don't get called on most of those. We've got to find yep. those things out. So it's operationally usually not very efficient. So I, sure. I don't want to create, say, we're going to do this and it still doesn't work. We still haven't solved your problem. I, I think the only way we are going to solve this problem is with a centralized resource. I'm putting up the concept here. We're not going to resolve it today. We're not going to identify how that resource is going to be established. We're not going to establish who it is. But I think the, the idea, the notion of a central authority is the way to go. Sorry, Drew. Yeah, Drew Richardson, Patty. Simon, you could probably preserve your conceptual idea if you eliminate the last sentence yep. and address the controversy within Dan, because uh, there's some good points being made. So. OK. All right. And I don't think we should debate this for much longer, guys, because we're not going to get this sorted. We're not going to establish who it is and how they're going to do it today. It's the concept of being able to contact a centralized resource when you have a rebreather accident for expert advice instead of doing the I got a guy thing. I'll take a comment over here. Yep. Jason Dahl, U.S. Coast Guard. Actually, I find this uh, idea very good. Having Dan would be our first point of contact, having the Coast Guard call them, and that way they would get the initial notification of a, of a rebreather fatality. I think that'd be a, a great idea to go ahead with. So. Yeah. Well, I, you know, if if we agree on this statement, then I can tell you what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be chatting to Nick offline and Dan Orr and the guys and saying, well, can we make this work for you in any way? Let's talk to David Concannon. Let's find out what the legal issues are. If that's not going to work, we'll find another way of doing it. But I think a centralized resource, there ain't one now, and I think that that's our best chance of making sure the right people get involved in the right place. Yep. Steve Newman, as a crime scene investigator, uh, this Can might you speak, be... You speak right into the microphone. As, as a crime scene investigator, this might well be distributed through sheriff's associations, law enforcement agencies, so that they're made directly aware. Uh, sometimes as an investigator uh, arrives on the scene, having a lot of outside influences sometimes kind of confuses investigations. If they know where to go already, uh, maybe instead of having Dan have the responsibility, if you can educate law enforcement agencies, it might work a little better. I, I think I, I th th that's a good point. I think the concept, though, is once we established it, what the people we would want to educate would be divers. So that when they're involved in an accident, just the same way they ring Dan when they're sick, they contact this resource to get advice on management of a rebreather accident. This is the last comment. My name is Paweł Szpiński from Jurgensen Marine, and I'm just wondering whether there is a point of uh, involving manufacturers in such instances, where each, for example, a manufacturer could offer a point of contact. So, for example, when, when there is an accident, the, on the rebreather itself, you can have an information or contact we're, number. We're coming back to that in the next statement. Okay. Okay. Is there anybody who disagrees with this statement as it currently exists? Is that a, is that, are you disagreeing? Okay, there's one, there's one person in disagreement. Can you note that for the record, please? So that is carried by a majority, a clear majority. Okay, this, Pavel, this will get to your point. The forum recommends, and this is a point that came out very strongly in several of the manufacturers' presentations. The forum recommends that in investigating a rebreather fatality, the principal accident investigator, whoever that happens to be, whether it's a policeman in New Zealand, a sheriff in the United States, a, 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 a coroner in the UK, a gendarme in France, whoever it is, the Coast Guard in the United States, the principal accident investigator invite the manufacturer of the incident rebreather 
to assist with its evaluation, including the crucial task of data download as early as is practicable. Would anyone like to speak to that? Gareth. Yeah, Gareth Locke, any of the manufacturers involved in the incident where you've got mixed teams, other download data may be useful in understanding um, what happened on the incident. Okay, so if I said manufacturer of the re incident rebreather or any other relevant equipment, would that work for you? That uh, addresses a, an issue that Bruce had about uh, data downloads from Shearwater. From computers, yep, yeah, or yep, yeah, yeah, I take that point on board. Good point, thank you. I, I, I personally agree with that modification. Does anyone object to that modification? Okay, can we take a vote on this? statement. Is there anybody who disagrees with this statement as it currently exists? Okay, we're carrying that unanimously. Uh, Kim, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're changing track from in, in rebreather accident investigation, although uh, this is a issue of relevance. Uh, and I just want to go on the record, and I've said it, I think, individually to the, in, to the individuals concerned, but I, I, you could have knocked me over with a feather when I walked into that session on Friday and had that paper handed to me with all those training numbers in it. That was an extraordinary thing, the likes of which we have never had before. So I, I don't know where you all are, but my congratulations to you, gentlemen. Extraordinary. The forum applauds and endorses the release of pulled pooled data, not individual agency data that identifies the individual agencies, pooled data describing numbers of rebreather certifications by training agencies and encourages other agencies to join ANDI, INTD and TDI in this initiative. Does anyone want to speak to that, particularly anyone from any of the other training agencies? Good Lord. <laughs> How, how many people know what epidemiology is? Oh, look, give us a break. <laughs> I think you've got to find another word. All right. Uh, this is just a title for the slide. I mean, uh, right, all right, all right, all right. All right. Do you remember that, ex that joke I made in my lecture about anal retentiveness of Germans and, and uh, Swiss people? <laughs> I, I'm about to expand that classification. Rebreather uh, training numbers. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Drew, do you have anything to say about this? Works for you. I mean, I and look, I, you know, you, you're probably not in there because you haven't been training rebreather divers. That's fine. I'm not. This, yeah, it helps when you've got some. I mean, you, you know, it's just, to be fair. You, I was just as blown away by the training accident data that you released at the fatality workshop. So, you know, Patty has been very open with their data. All right, can we have a vote on this? Is there anybody who objects to this statement in its current form? Thank you. That's great. Carried unanimously. Excuse me, before we, we uh, move on, can I ask a question about the accident investigation? Sorry? My name is Jeff Frank. I'm from yep. the Cambrian Foundation. Uh, I, I was I curious about the... Now, which slide are we referring to here? Uh, can you go back to the investigation slides? Okay, we have voted on it. Yep, that's okay. I'll I'm allow this once. Don't anyone else think about doing the same one? I'm, I'm actually curious... Uh, that one there? No, uh, I'm actually curious if maybe a fourth one would be interesting because uh, one of the exciting things I saw in this presentation was about the black boxes included in these machines. Yeah. And uh, I know I saw several slides where the information was amazing, and I yeah. saw a couple of them where uh, the information trailed off after some period of time. Yeah. And I'm wondering if we feel like the standards for data retention and the parameters collected are appropriate, and if we're happy with how those are working, or if we need uh, standards and maybe some certifications to put the computers and equipment through to make sure that we retain the data after uh, a computer sits on the bottom of the ocean or something. So your, your, your statement is something along the lines that uh, we would be specifying some parameters that we would want the rebreathers, rebreather manufacturers black boxes to meet 
in order to be useful to us? Y yes, test cases. Specifically, I'm wondering if we can solve some of the problem of accident inves investigation with technology by providing, hey, we know that it could be turned back on on a boat. We know that it could be rattled in a Zodiac on the way back to shore. Yep. You know, let, let's have some standards about when an incident occurs or when some parameters are exceeded. Can we make sure the computer operates in a way to save the data? Yep. So some of those issues you raise are very specific. And what we'll do is put those questions on hold and see where we're at at the end of the presentation because if we start talking about that now, I know what's going to happen. We, we won't get through the rest of it. All right, thank you. Is it? Thank you. Oof, shivers. <laughs> Can I just do a little bit of editing here? <laughs> right. The, uh, the <laughs> I, this is a really important initiative, and I, it just got raised several times, and I think I know, and I, the last speaker is probably sitting there thinking, you're making all these statements of the obvious and you're not getting down to the nitty gritty. You, you often can't get, the, the, the rest of the forum was for getting down to the nitty gritty. This is a recognition of an important initiative that I think has the potential to give us a lot of valuable information. And by endorsing this statement, we're just getting it out there in the public domain in the findings of this workshop. So. The forum endorses the DAN Worldwide Initiative to provide a means of online incident reporting with subsequent analysis and publication of incident root causes. I'll be honest, I wasn't really expecting much objection to this, uh, but does anyone want to speak to it? Oh, very good, thank you. So that is carried unanimously. So now we move into the area that uh, John chaired, and uh, we've got a number of statements here about design and testing. Uh, and how are we going for time, Neil? Uh, 5.30. Oh, okay, so, w w but when are we expected to finish? We have an hour. So I'm pacing, I'm trying to pace this properly. And okay, so, so this statement says that the forum recommends that all, all electronic rebreathers incorporate data logging systems which record dive and functional parameters relevant to the particular unit and which allow download of these data. Diagnostic reconstruction of dives with as many relevant parameters as possible should be the goal of this initiative. And as a footnote, I want to state that an ideal goal would be the establishment of a common format and content for the data that should be collected by the different rebreathers. Actually, this kind of gets to the point that the last speaker was making. Is there anybody that, other than your perfectly legitimate observation that if we go down this path or if the manufacturers go down this path, there'll need to be some definitions, that's not our job to establish here today, but Gavin. We'll just, what we'll do is we'll just reserve that microphone for Gavin if everyone else would like to go to that. No, can your we, input's great, mate. Can okay. we take the word electronic out? Uh, so so let's, let's talk about that. Uh, I, put it, I thought about that and I put it there because what are the makers of Halcyon going to say, the makers of the RB80 going to say when this comes out? I mean, I, I know it's not obligating anyone to anything, but... What will they say? I mean, then they don't have electronics in their rebreathers, so they would, in order to comply with the spirit of this, they would have to install uh, an electronic data logging system in a rebreather that doesn't have electronics. D does that change what you say, or do you still think I should take it out? Gavin, come. I would still like to see it taken out, because most rebreathers at least have got a PO2 monitor. Yeah, the RB80 doesn't, and not, not as a stock standard yeah, item. Yeah, but anyway. most do, and if you've got that, then you've got some capability of uh, black box. Okay. Uh, now, look, I, I actually am um, swinging on this one. I don't, I don't have a strong view. So let's take a vote on the issue of electronic or not electronic. Who would like to see electronic taken out of there so that it says all rebreathers? Okay, and who would like to see it stay there as it is? Okay, it goes. Yeah. 
on a majority basis. Okay, so the forum recommends that all rebreathe. Well, yeah, I don't need to read Simon, it. Simon, can I just. Simon, sorry. Paul Haynes, uh, UK. Should it be all future electronic rebreather designs? Or are we going to expect manufacturers to upgrade all designs to incorporate this recommendation? Of course, you said there's no mandate, but should it be all future rebreather designs? Uh. So we incorporate the, net, the, the up and no. coming generation as opposed no, to. No, I don't, I don't think that's the spirit of it, Paul. I think that mm -hmm. the aim is that actually, probably what it should say is all recreational rebreathers, in fact, because we wouldn't expect oxygen units being run by militaries or your di design to have this. Um, does anyone have any objection to me inserting the word recreational in there? What's the difference between recreational and sport diving? Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. Sport diving. Fair, fair, fair play. Simon, what about people who get hold of... Gareth Locke. Gareth Locke, Lock, sorry. Um, what about people who get hold of commercial military rebreathers and use them? You oh, want to know how they pork it up? Yeah, uh, look, well... Uh, yeah. What I mean is just keep it as all rebreathers. Yeah, but is there spill over there then into con with confusion about... What about all rebreathers used by sport divers? Okay. Yep. Okay. okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll tell you what, before I change anything, let's run with a little bit more discussion. So, Nigel, what about, what have you got? Yeah, this is Nigel Jones. Um, I think you should consider adding the word redundant data logging systems. Sorry, the word? Redundant data logging systems. So the point being is, if you have a single data logging system and it fails, what do you do? So if you're going to go to the trouble of doing it, should you make it redundant such that you've always got a data log available? Okay. Uh, Nigel, before you leave the microphone, can I just ask you, in, to your knowledge, how many of the current rebreathers have redundant data logging systems? I know of one. Do you know of any others? I'm not familiar with their architectures. Okay. Can I just put that question to Martin Parker? How many rebreathers do you know of with redundant data logging systems? Um, we, we, we have the capability of doing it. We've never needed it, um, but we have three processes. Uh, Can you speak? Sorry, yeah, we have three processes on the system, so we have the capability. Um, we do record a little bit of information in the controllers, but uh, generally we, we uh, record all the data in the handset. So uh, we don't have a full redundant redundant system in terms of, of all the information, but for some of the information. Okay, I'm uh, okay. We'll come back to that thing. Uh, your concern, Nigel, uh, Tom. We'll just let Tom a bit Mount, of discussion run here. Would it be more proper to say they have some means of recording it, like an external computer could even record this data? Something so all like the House in 80, or B80, like the El Presidente, it'll be kind of difficult to get this information in unless they have an external service to do it. Uh, actually, well, I'll be honest, Tom, that's not really the, uh, my, I have a higher level goal in, with this statement. What we're trying to do here, and I think I didn't make up the term diagnostic reconstruction, I think Bruce Partridge might have to be credited with, credited with that, but if it, with that kind of system, you couldn't do a diagnostic reconstruction of the dive, and I think that should be our goal. Gavin, let's hear from you. Uh, I'm going to go back to say all rebreathers. Yeah. Uh, this is not a sports diving rebreather forum. It's a rebreather forum. There are military, commercial, there's a whole range of people here. Now, if you're worried about the oxygen rebreathers for the military, they're going to ignore what you say anyway. So. Yeah, they can. Yeah, you're right about that. Of course they wouldn't, would they? <laughs> okay, look, I'm going to make an executive decision, and we, we can vote on the statement. Uh, I'm going to take that out and say all rebreathers. Um, I'm going to re address the redundant side of it in a moment. Uh, Martin Parker, just one small note. Uh, I think the uh, common format might be a little step too far, but uh, if you put it in as a goal, that's fine, but I've just got a feeling that it's... Uh, um, for us to change to another format now would be very difficult. For uh, Poseidon to change to another format would be quite difficult too. Um, so I, I just think it's probably a step too far. 
would you object to it saying common content? So that, yeah, as, that's, as a that's goal, good. As, that's good. Is that all right? That's good. Okay. I, I'm I'm happy with that. So my sense, Nigel, on the issue of redundancy is that I'm reluctant to put it in there at this point in time. I understand that it would be a laudable goal, but equally my sense is that redundancy and data logging... Actually, Martin, can I ask you a question? Because I don't want to dismiss this without any objective sort of sense of it. In, and <laughs> this is going to seem really bad, but in the accidents that you, you know, you've had the opportunity to download data on a, a moderate number of accidents, right? Because you've got a lot of rebreathers out there. That's correct, yeah. In how many of those cases, what proportion of cases have you failed to get that data because of a lack of redundancy? In uh, actually the deceased's rebreather, uh, we've always managed to get the data. You've always managed to get it? Yeah, no problem. It's, it was this, the, uh, the one where the data was corrupted was on the uh, partner's rebreather. Okay. I'd like it to be noted for the record that the issue of redundancy was raised and that I don't think any of us here would argue in a real world, that uh, an ideal world that we had redundancy, but I, I do not feel inclined to put it in this statement. Okay, I've just had a, I don't know who that was, but someone suggested to put it in the footnote. Uh, I think that would be a reasonable thing to do, yeah. actually. Yeah. Jacob Zahajegolem here, put it in the footnote, which yeah. is the ideal goal, yeah. and then it's covered. Yeah, would be to, a comment, uh, to, to incorporate redundancy, it would be to, Uh, work with me, work with me, uh, to be, would be to incorporate redundant, I, I'll figure this out later, and to establish a common content, uh, establish common content. Okay, we'll fix the spelling mistakes later. Is there anybody in here who objects to this statement as it currently reads? Sorry? Read the footnote. Oh, okay. The, the footnote now reads, an ideal goal would be to incorporate redundancy. Uh, this will need wordsmithing. But incorporate redundancy and to establish a common content for data to be collected. So nobody objects. Okay. We've carried that statement unanimously. Thank you. So, the next uh, design and testing statement, uh, and we're doing pretty well. I think we've got, this is, this five, this is one of five more to go, so we're good. The forum endorses the need for third-party pre-market testing to establish that rebreathers are fit for purpose. Ideally, this testing should be to an agreed universal standard and should result in public reporting of a uniform suite of practically important parameters such as canister duration. I'd like to open that statement for discussion. Kevin Gurr, could you add the word unmanned in there? Unmanned? Unmanned. Yep, yeah, I could, yeah, definitely. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah, Mark. Mark Powell, should the result in public reporting of a uniform suite of practically important parameters be taken outside of the ideally clause? So can I ask either Kevin or Martin or any of the, or, or Leon, what's the current, what do you currently do? Do you currently report your, publicly report the results of your pre-market testing. Is that what you currently do? Any of you? Leon Scamahorn, Interspace Systems. Well, it's part of your market plan. Uh, you know, you put out there that, uh, you know, achieve scrubber duration uh, under this workload, at this depth, at this water temperature, 
uh, and you state that what the standard was, it was tested to. So like we use the 14143, uh, and we also use the US Navy criteria. Uh, and we, we quote both of those when we conduct. Uh, so, so in other words, you, this, if we took that out of the ideally, that would mean that wouldn't be any imposition on, on rebreather manufacturers as no. they currently practice. Okay, I like that idea. So what we'll do is we'll put the, no, because the agreed universal standard might be a bit of a sticking point, I think. But that's, that's definitely ideally. Rebreathers are fit for purpose. Results. Oh, whoops. Results should be. Publicly, I'll wordsmith this a bit. You trust me on that. I won't change the meaning, but I mean it's just a bit hard to to word it nicely. Um, uh, results of a okay. Results of a unit. Oh, what did I do there? Oh yeah, oh, it's, yeah, should be, oh, that's what happened there. Okay, should be reported publicly. Yeah, cool, okay. So we've taken the reporting, public reporting of results out of the ideal realm and we've put, uh, we've kept the, the uniform standard in the ideal realm. Pavel. Yes, uh, Paul uh, Szczepinski from Jungus and Berlin. I would just add as an extra to the uh, to parameters, uh, things like the work of breathing uh, and the uh, scrubber material. Okay. Did you want to say something, Oscar? Yeah, uh, Oscar, Oscar from, uh, from Sweden. I was referring to the, the statement by Kevin Gurr, the unmanned... Uh, speak straight into the microphone. The unmanned statement by Kevin Gurr. I, I, practical performance is pretty big uh, part of uh, the uh, European standard today. And uh, uh, if we're going to have unmanned there, I think we should have manned or, or just take the unmanned away. It is so... I mean, just testing a rebreather unmanned is, is just not... Okay, tell me this, is the ma ask, answer me this Oscar, or someone who's yep. familiar with the standards, I'm quite is, the pre -market, is the pre-market third party testing ever manned? There, there is a large part of the standard today which is practical performance conducted by a third three party. divers on five units. So why did Kevin want it to be unmanned? Kevin are you here? Yeah, Kevin Gurr, you, you're partially right, we should probably expand on this a little bit. The way it works under 14143 at the moment is that the, the bulk of the work is done in an unmanned environment. Yep. And then once the manufacturer, I guess, and the standard is satisfied that you have a fit for purpose machine, there is then a section of 14143 that requires some manned analysis. Yes. It's not in a laboratory environment. It's basically divers going out and doing test dives, writing reports, all that kind of thing. Right. So why do you want unmanned testing? Why do you want I think it? what I was trying to say there is, as Leon just said, it's, it's very much a pre-market thing. Yep. So it's important, just from a safety aspect really, that before anyone gets into any kind of manned trials, there is a completely unmanned validation. I guess that's what I'm trying to say in there. It is. Actually, yeah, so Oscar, I'm, I'm kind of sympathetic to Kevin's view there, and this is not saying that there shouldn't be manned testing. This is, there should be unmanned testing with reporting of these results. We don't usually see, though, that, as Kevin just outlined, I don't recall seeing the sort of informal reports of manned testing being publicly reported, and I don't think that's what we're demanding. Can you live with that? Okay. Can, can I offer a clarification? Yeah. 
you, you've got two separate things here. The first sentence is the forum endorses third party testing to ensure it's fit for purpose. Yes. That can be unmanned, manned, that can be everything. So make that bit generic. Yeah, yeah, cool, yep. Okay. Now the results that you're going to give are hard numerical data. And I yes. think that should come from the unmanned aspect. Because that takes out the, a lot of the variability. I'll wordsmith it later. Nice suggestion. Martin. Martin Parker. Yeah, I'm not too happy on the uniform suite of information. Where are we going to get that uniformity from? And we're we going to have another meeting on that between all the manufacturers. And uh, canister duration and type of material are mandatory, in my opinion. Uh, work of breathing certainly isn't. You either meet the standard or you don't. So I, I would go for canister duration and type of material. Uh, and I would take out uniform yeah. suite. Okay, these are just examples, of course. They're not everything, but I'll, I'll, I'll put uh, and type of material. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so the uniform suite, w I put that in there because of a comment that was made during the discussion that it would be nice to know the same thing about every rebreather. So that when we line all the rebreathers up, we've got the same data on every rebreather. That was why the uniform suite is there. It's a, it's a goal, it's not, I mean, uh, I, I'd be happy to put results of practically important unmanned testing parameters, that's fine. We can take out uniform suite. Let me just ask, John, did you want to talk to that point or have you got something else, something different? Just to the last sentence. Okay, we'll come back to you. Is there anyone who would object to me taking out uniform suite? There are a few. Is there anyone who would definitely like me to take out uniform suite, other than Mr. Parker? Martin, I'm sorry, <laughs> it stays, it stays Simon, in it. Simon, Neil Pollock, can you solve it by putting it in the ideally section? Uh, no, I think, they, I think uh, the view okay, of the meeting is pretty gonna, clear. If you're going to have a uniform suite, then you'd better just agree on here and now what, what, it, what you want to well, show. Well, I, no, I, look, I, I, I think... Yeah, you haven't you just guys just started an organisation called Reza? You could talk about it there. I th look, this is a this is what this forum would like. It's not a mandate that you have to follow. It's endorsing a requirement for third party testing and uh, should be reported. We'd like to know the same things about all the different units. Okay, John. My uh, only question about the last sentence is that's somehow an implies that having an agreed universal standard is in fact a good thing and uh, at least for the near future we will have US standards and we will have the uh, European standard so it's I mean it would be really really ideal I suspect it would be quite a while before we have a universal standard Did, so you were the chair of that focus zone and I'm very reluctant to disagree with you was it your sense from the focus zone you chaired, that people did or did not agree with a uniform standard? Because the sense I got, and the reason this is there, is that there was a general view that a uniform standard was a good idea. Well, I, I think the opinion is that there could be more than one standard. More than one. Uh, certainly we hear a lot about the uh, European standards, but we also, as Martin as uh, somebody in indicated, they had to follow the U.S. Navy standard as okay. well. Okay. Is there anyone who would object? So I think what John is signaling here is that in the near future, the United States of America might develop its own standard, and who's to say that that has to be the same as EN 14143? Is that right? Or it, can, it could eventually be an ISO standard, which or an could ISO be a standard. universal standard. Okay. I buy, I buy that argument. Is there anyone here who would object to me taking out that last sentence? Uh, how about going to uh, an international recogni uh, internationally recognised standard? Okay. Yep, that would be fine. Yep, yep. Uh, would you agree, disagree with that, John? Is that all right? Yep, okay. To an internationally recognised standard. <coughs> okay, I've uh, still got the objection on work of breathing, and uh, work of breathing, uh, the breathing effort consists of many issues, including hydrostatic lung loading and things like that. So, um, 
you know, what I'm worried about is people buying products just on numbers, and uh, you can have a slightly higher resistive workload, uh, but extremely low hydrostatic load, and overall a much lower worker breathing, perceived worker breathing. So what I don't want people to do is buy products on the wrong numbers, because they don't really understand the issue anyway. So if you're, if you're either uh, meeting a European standard or you're not, or whatever the standard is, you're either meeting it or you're not. And uh, I just think that uh, we sort of risk pe people buying products just on numbers. So Martin, but the alternative is no information, right? And I don't think this meeting is going to accept that. That would be my sense. Is, does this make it any better for you? So, the t so such as uh, canister duration, and in fact, uh, we could take out type of material because that would fall into the qualified by the relevant experimental parameters. So such as canister duration and worker breathing qualified by a statement of, by clear statement of experimental parameters. Then, uh, I mean, I don't think it's going to be acceptable to this forum that we just say, well, because people can fudge the way they report this, we don't, we accept them not reporting it at all. I don't think we can say that. I think we, I think the feeling of the meeting is that people want to know these things, but what you're saying is you want to know the circumstances under which they were measured. To the average person, just the resistive workload, which is what worker breathing is, is particularly meaningless. And you can have a low worker breathing rebreather, which is horrendous to breathe from, if the cantilever is in the wrong position. So, um, you know, I just just think it's misleading. So, your view is we shouldn't want you to report this information. Worker breathing should be uh, shouldn't be in there. Canister duration and the material type should be mandatory. Should be in there. The canister duration and Material type should be in there. Okay. Uh, worker breathing shouldn't. Okay. Well, look, I, I'm going to put that one to the vote. Do you have something to say about that? Just we're going to need to move on from this because we've been bogged down on this one. I think that if we're going to put VOB in there, I think that we should have hydrostatic imbalance. And, and we should have what? We should have hydrostatic imbalance as well and and uh, elastins or. Okay. Compliance. So, shall I just take out these examples? Okay. No. No. No, I think, I, I think, ha, how many people would be happy for me to take these examples out? How many people do not want these examples taken out? That's the majority view. I'm going to leave it there. Sorry, Simon, can I jump in? Paul Haynes? Yep. By referencing international standards, by default, you're capturing these things. Are we not? Well, if it's done to an international standard, yep. We'll reference them. So I guess we are then by default re capturing them by referencing international standards. Okay, we're going to take a vote on this. I know there are going to be some objections to it because of the way it's currently worded, but we're going to, it's going to go on the majority. So how many people in here object to the way, to this statement as it is currently worded? There are some objections, yeah. And how many people are in favour of this statement as it's currently worded? Okay, it's carried with a clear majority. Thank you. Okay, this arises from Kevin Gers. Uh, by the way, thank you for your patience. Those of you who weren't actively uh, involved in this discussion didn't start chatting and creating mayhem in the background, and I appreciate that, so thank you. This statement says, this comes out of Kevin Gers' survey data. Was it Kevin? It was Kevin, wasn't it? This is the survey you reported, yep. The forum acknowledges recent survey data indicating a poor understanding amongst train users of rebreather operational limits in relation to depth and carbon dioxide scrubber duration, and therefore recommends, one, that training organisations emphasise these parameters in training courses, and two, that manufacturers display these parameters in places of prominence in device, documentations, in device documentation and on the websites. Does anyone want to speak to this? I, I mean, I didn't anticipate too much objection to this, to be perfectly honest, but um, you probably all do it now, I suspect. But we've got to acknowledge that survey data and perhaps the training organisation emphasis of it is a good thing. Okay, can we take a vote on this? Is there anyone who disagrees with this statement as it is in its current form? Okay, that statement is carried unanimously. Thank you. The next uh, statement speaks to Nigel's presentation uh, 
outstanding presentation, actually, in my view, this morning. The forum strongly endorses industry initiatives to improve oxygen measurement technologies and advocates consideration of potentially beneficial emerging strategies, such as dynamic validation of cell readings and alternatives to galvanic fuel cells. Does anyone want to speak to this statement? Okay, so we'll take a vote. Is there anyone who disagrees with this statement as it is currently written? That's carried unanimously, thank you. Uh, now, this, I thought this discussion was fascinating, and uh, this arises out of the, the session that John chaired, uh, and it's a statement that we decided to, this is, the, this is a unique statement because it's the only one in which we're proposing a research question to the, to the research community. But I, I think Paul's point is very well made. This, this arose out of Paul Haynes' advocacy for the use of gag straps. But the resulting discussion made it clear that there was a lot of ambiguity in people's perceptions around whether they really would preserve your airway in an unconscious situation or not. And to my knowledge, there is no data or even substantial practical experience that answers that question for us. And so, this statement says, the forum identifies as a research question the issue of whether a mouthpiece retaining strap would provide protection of the airway in an unconscious diver. We need to find a very compliant ethics committee. <laughs> or interesting imaginative way of figuring it out. It may be impossible, but is there anyone who would like to speak to this? A couple of people. Sepp Chander from the UK. Can we include full face masks in that? Well, we actually have a statement about full face masks coming up next. Thank you. Uh, Carl Shreed's Patty, just a small point, unconscious rebreather diver, that's what we're here about. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. thank you, Carl. Paul Raymarkers, I'm sorry that I didn't see that. Uh, Can you speak into the I was not able to follow that presentation. Uh, I just hear that uh, the impression is there's no proof or any evidence that the uh, mouthpiece retaining strap has any uh, efficiency. We do have uh, a typical case of fatality a few years ago where it was clearly proven that uh, when the, the jaw stress completely falls away, when the, the, the gag strap is correctly attached, that the mouthpiece stays in the mouth of the diver and uh, no water comes in the, the diver's lungs or in the unit. So you, if I'm interpreting you correctly, Paul, you're saying there has been a case yes. that you know of, of an unconscious diver underwater Yes. with a gag strap and a mouthpiece in place where there was no in, in, in ingress of water to the airway. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, now, John, do you want to speak to this? I mean, we had a conversation about this. Sorry, Oscar, I will come back to you. I think research would include looking at pr prior history. Yep. One case does not make, mean the uh, problem has, has been solved. Uh, Oscar from, uh, from Sweden. I'd uh, that was exactly what I was pointing at. Uh, we who come from the uh, military com community know that uh, combat swimmers have been using this for a while, and I thought that if we just do a, 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 a look at our own data from, from uh, the fatalities we have had, we probably can, can, can look if, if uh, there has been water in the airways or not. In okay, I, I like that idea. So, so what we need is uh, someone who has a perhaps a naval group with some keen young uh, research hungry doctors who would like to start phoning up every navy in the world and asking them if they've had any instances. I'll bet you there are. I know, I'm sure you're I mean, my tongue's in my cheek if I've got a smile on my face. I think there probably may be enough information out there already to inform this debate. I think there probably would be, but we've just got to find it. And it would be great to have that reported. If someone could compile the cases and report them. If we had a dozen cases that had gone unconscious with a gag strap in place and hadn't ingressed water, I think that would be a pretty powerful case. Okay, is there anybody, uh, I'll wordsmith this. So uh, for your benefit, or have you got it? Have you, Kim, do you want me to read it? Okay, so is there anyone who objects to this statement in its current form? 
Thank you. That's carried as a unanimous statement. Now this is a statement that John was keen to include as a result of his uh, focus group. The forum recommends that industry and divers interact with the goal of optimizing a full face mask for use with rebreathers. And this is uh, largely on the basis that while on the face of it a full face mask presents a lot of advantages in terms of airway protection, as was mentioned by a number of discussants, the, there are advantage, disadvantages that come with them also, particularly in the realm of rebreather technical diving and the need for gas switching, and in some cases multiple gas switches. So, uh, Jill. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that unfortunately this was one of the sessions where we didn't have the opportunity for feedback and questions and comments at the end, so I don't know if there was any clear consensus. If you want to um, say something, say it now. This is good well, yeah, I mean just that that there are many other issues and perhaps this could be worded in a way similar to the last question, that it's a, it's a research question because there are uh, many downsides to full face masks that need to be examined as well. Okay. Such as? <laughs> Someone just said such as. Um, they're not designed for closed circuit. Um, they in, uh, introduce new failure points, visibility issues, mobility issues, CO2 buildup, need for extra gas for flushing, need for training to uh, train for clearing. Um, emergency bailout situations, spare mask situations, there's a lot of things that need to be studied. Yeah. John, would you have any objection to me uh, rewording this into a research question? Uh, okay, let's hear what uh, Gavin's got to say, Gavin. I could say no comment, but that wouldn't work. <laughs> no. um, in response to Jill, the military have addressed this over years. The military have the answer to most of those questions and they are working in the military environment. Um, so, you know, recommending or moving forward or finding how to move that technology into a more universal aspect is good. So, I, I mean, either recommend or make it a, a research aspect, but, um, you know. So you're, you're happy with the yeah. spirit of this. Yep, Tom? Okay, I'm gonna make a comment based on some personal experience on the full phase. You have a lot of experience with, but when I was testing the original house of Jack Kellen, we had the canister break loose at uh, 24 and 20 meters and uh, 60 feet. And uh, during that process, I got a with the full face mask, I got one hell of a caustic where I had to come up, get the mouthpiece, they get open circuit, try to keep the water down below here. I don't think training rebreather divers on a full face is necessarily a good or safe process. Yes, uh, power from Jurgis Marine once again. I was just thinking maybe adding appropriate training. If you go and I use the mask, maybe just include that as an additional recommendation. So if people are going to use the mask and if you're going to endorse full spade mask, you should at the same time seek appropriate training to become proficient rather than just endorse purchasing a full spade mask and getting people so, to put on. Yeah, no, look, I, I don't have any difficulty with the issue that training is critically important. What we're really getting at here is whether full face is a concept that's a good thing. For, I mean, if we accept that it's a good thing, then training clearly is critical. But the spirit of this is really trying to get a sense of whether we should be saying to rebreather divers that full face masks are a, a good thing for rebreather diving. I think we're one step back from actually talking about the training. The training would clearly be important, but that's not the spirit. It's a bit like the gag strap question. We're okay. trying to decide whether these are a good idea or not. So maybe somewhere along the lines when you've got the optimizing, uh, optimizing not just the uh, full face mask itself, but the practices of the closed circuit divers. I think I think I might take optimizing out because that's got okay. the, that's sort of got the expectation of a positive outcome about it, um, okay. with the goal of establishing P practices. Well, no okay. feasibility is what okay. I'm thinking of. Yeah, I have feasibility, reasonably, yeah. Okay, um, Richard. Richard Walker, Duke. I would like to say I agree wholeheartedly with Tom and with Jill on this. Um, with respect to our military colleagues, we do use this equipment in a substantially different way 
And I'm not aware of any evidence to date to prove that in the manner that we use this equipment, a full space mass offers a clear safety advantage. That, that would need to be established first. And once that's established, or if that's established, then I think we can move on to the need to develop a product. But I would support more of a research focus on okay. this to look at whether or not we're sure, before we met, jump the gun, that a full face mask does in fact offer more advantages than disadvantages in the way that we use rebreathers. You know you should shave your beard off before you put one on, don't you, Richard? So I'm going to change this to the same sort of style as we had before. Yeah, okay, so the, the forum identifies as a research question the feasibility of full face masks for use with rebreathers. Neil? Neil Pogsheim, should that be efficacy rather than feasibility? We know it's feasible. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. No, you're right. Yeah. As usual when it comes to wordsmithing issues. Okay. We won't get too too much more on this. Yeah. Uh, uh, Terrence Sansel, U.S. Army and the Cambrian Foundation. I, I'm going to fall in line with Tom and Jill on this one. I, I just... Uh, I, I think to for, for us to recommend the use of a particular thing is... is do we all remember the, the famous open circuit debate we had on this topic, what, 15, 20 years ago? I mean, that was the whole thing in open circuit. People are going to start passing yeah. out on deco and all that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, we no, know I'll they work with Terrence, rebreathers, I, and I think I, that's I'm personal. I'm completely thing. happy with that perspective. And, and I actually think that phrasing this in this way, mm -hmm. this puts a very cautionary tone on the whole issue of full face masks. I just want to make sure we shy away from, rebreather diving. from yeah. you know, that, because uh, that's, I want to keep that that ability to be able okay. to deny that or not. So. Okay, I'll, I'll take, these are the two last comments on this issue. Gareth? Gareth Locke, uh, you might solve that by putting sport or recreational. We know the military and commercial rebreathers already use full face masks and, and they've got processes for that. What we're talking about is in the, the sport or recreational environment. Yeah, okay, so I think this is one case where it is reasonable to distinguish between uh, military and recreational re sport, okay. Yeah, that's right, because we're getting t confused with terminology. Yep. I, th I think we're still flirting a little bit on that knife edge of a lot of opinion here. I think it's a really worthwhile thing to look into. Uh, we've been diving 20 or 30 years with full face masks, yep. and we love the ability to use communications. Yep. Nobody's commented I'll, on look, that. Look, I, I don't... I don't think there's any suggestion that they're not appropriate in certain specific contexts. So, look, we know that. It's just whether it's a, a, a thing that we recommend as, gener as a general strategy for recreational sport re rebreathers in general. And I think the sense I'm getting from the forum is that this is something that we would like more engagement with the people who know how to use them before we move forward with this. That's agreed. I'd be happy to leave, leave it like this. Okay, now we've got one more very important statement to do, so let's get this one wrapped up so that we can get on to it, because it's another one that might involve a little bit of discussion. So, is there anybody, who, so this reads, the forum identifies as a research question the efficacy of full face masks for use with sport rebreathers. Is there anyone who objects to this in its current form? I know it doesn't. Well, no, it does. It does. No, it does. It puts a tone on it, David. It, it, it's basically saying that this forum there's been a discussion at this forum that gives the sense that they're not something that we think are generalizable across the rebreather diving community and that we need more information experience with it. Anyway, the vote's been taken. That's it. I want to get onto this one because it's, it's the, the last one here, the la you see another slide here, but I'm not sure we're even going to discuss that. It's one I put in there if we were running out of time, if we had too much time on our hands. But this is one that is important and potentially controversial. Oh, well, may maybe not actually. The forum recognizes and endorses the industry and training agency initiative to characterize recreational and technical streams of rebreather diver training. These groups will have different working envelopes, training, and equipment needs. And this was discussed quite a lot in the last session that was chaired by uh, Phil and Jill. 
So, is there anyone who would like to speak to this? Is there anyone who objects to the concept? Steve? I mean, Andrew Fock, you might want to speak to this. I think you spoke, well, you spoke pretty clearly before about it. Uh, S Steve Lewis, I think that, haven't we already kind of established that what everyone does here isn't military, scientific, uh, commercial? So we're doing recreational diving, and recreational diving kind of falls into sport diving and technical diving. I just, it's not a big point, but, you know, everyone else has been nitpicking, so I figured I'd better do yeah, it. Uh, uh, well, I think, uh, yeah. who are you speaking about in particular, uh, Stevie? Um, I think the, the reason for the statement is that these are terms that I think are going to be brought into, brought higher and higher in our consciousness by the training organizations and the manufacturers. I think this is a route that they want to go down and a distinction that they want to make. It's been raised here a number of times, and this is essentially a recognition of it. Richard. Richard Walker, dude, can we pull the word working out and just change it to operational so that we don't get into that whole OSHA <laughs> can, can we side? just speak more into the microphone and uh, a bit Sorry. better? Can we pull the word working out and change it to operational so that we stay away from that whole OSHA military scientific issue? I don't want technical diving to be identified as a... Different operational. Right. Mark, do you want to say anything about this? Mark Caney? Question. <laughs> I like it. Uh, uh, I'm not surprised. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Okay, I just have a question here. Who would these working groups be? Would they be made up of the training agents themselves and the manufacturers? I'm sorry, which working groups? groups? Uh, we, we t we're referring to the groups of divers, so recreational divers and technical divers will have different operational training and equipment needs. So we've, we heard in the previous session that there was a defined set of parameters okay, by which I, I these... Okay, I thought you were talking about groups to evaluate it, I'm sorry. Yeah, I misunderstood no, the statement. No, no, okay. no, that's not the intent of the statement. Harry? Uh, just a quick one, Richard Harris, do you want to put sport rebreather diving training? Does that help? Yeah. Anyone else want to speak to this statement? With any luck? No, no, where you go, Gavin. It's great, it's great, it's great input. I have one concern with this, and it is a safety concern. Yes. And that is the fact that the macho aspect will force people, I want to be technical, I want to go down that route. I think there is much more of a sliding scale. You know, you don't go up to a point just recreational and then suddenly flip to be technical. You can progress slowly and through that. And I think there is a safety concern here that you may inadvertently push people to do things that they don't want to because you put certain names there. Jill, do you want to talk, speak to that? I would suggest that this statement does the exact opposite, that it recognizes that particular equipment is good for particular type of diving, meaning in the recreational envelope, it's, I've got a problem, therefore I bail out and go to the surface, and that that equipment shouldn't really do anything or allow for anything more than that and allow for a sliding scale between those two entities. So that's, I like the statement. Dale Blitzo here. I think that the, uh, all the training agencies are doing that anyway. They've got recreational training and they've got technical training. Uh, yeah, so th as I pointed out, I, I know this is kind of one of those statements of the obvious, but it's this is the first rebreather forum that we've had since that distinction was made, and hence the the desire for the statement to be made. Pavel. Uh, yes, pa uh, Pavel from uh, Jacobson Marine. I'm just thinking maybe technical could be replaced with extended range, which would kind of better describe it. I, I don't think that, I think that the specific terminology that is being proposed is technical. Is that correct, Mark? There's technical rebreather and, and, and recreational rebreather. I think within the sport diving community, there's a distinct understanding of the terms recreational and technical. Yeah. And so this is a, a good definition as it stands. Okay, thank you. Andrew. Uh, Andrew Falk, Melbourne. Um, 
What exactly do you mean by endorses? That we agree with it. We don't think it's a bad idea. So presumably this won't be a unanimous decision then. <laughs> no. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Barry Common from RAID. Um, there may be... Um, you question. speak into the microphone. It's Sorry. Right. Barry Coleman from RAID. There may be question with regard to what is technical with regard to sport rebreather. Some may claim that if you're on a rebreather and you're bailing out to a side sling cylinder, that is technical. Are we, a, are we taking the, the recreational or technical from the open circuit and trying to apply it to rebreather diving where there could be argument that this is technical in itself in bailing out, yeah. whether you're bailing out to turning a switch on the mouthpiece or you're actually having to bail out to a side sling cylinder. Could there be a problem in this? I don't know if any of the, uh, the people from the uh, Training and Operations Forum want to speak to that, but uh, my understanding, Bar Bar Barry is it? Barry. Barry, is that uh, there's a very specific definition of what recreational rebreather is, and that definition was displayed on the uh, during the session. I actually don't have it here, but there's a very there's a set of criteria that defines recreational, and I think anything outside of that is what is technical. Uh, would you like to speak to that, either Mark or Jill? Have I got that right? Am I? Uh, yes. Again, I would say that there is a fairly clear understanding of what these two things are, and I think the important thing about this statement is it. it it's recognizing the fact that now, as opposed to when we had the last one of these forums, there is such a thing as a recreational rebreather user as opposed to what we call a technical rebreather user. Yep. And that this MIDI recognizes that delineation and the fact they have different operating envelopes and different needs. I think we'll call that discussion closed now, and I'm going to ask for all those who disagree with this statement in its present form to put up their hands. Yeah, so there are some, but it's a clear minority. So that is that statement is adopted with a clear majority. So that's the end of the consensus session. Don't go away before you think about doing it. I'd like to congratulate this forum on a remarkably mature discussion, completely absent of vitriol abuse and other forms of negative argument. I think it's been a fabulous event. I'd like to offer my thanks once more to Dick and Roz, Paddy, the other organising organisations, and my thanks for inviting me to be part of it. Thank you very much. And Dick Van is going to address you now. Thank yeah, you. Sucks. <laughs> before you go, Dick, um, just before, just, just one question. Is it, sorry, Simon, oh, you did a great job, thank you. I brought the subject up about solo diving and, and diving with a buddy, and uh, it seems like we're not going to get it as a, a, an idea from, from this forum, but can we show a, a, a hand, hands up who agrees that, let's, I've got to word this carefully, so, solo, uh, rebreather diving should be done in pairs. How about that? Show your hands, please, if you believe that. Or teams, pairs or teams. Now. Okay, please put your hands down. Any, everybody who thinks that uh, rebreather diving should be done solo. Okay, rebreather diving could be done sh solo. Okay, so I'll leave you to that. Thank you. So do you think that's worth putting up there as a, a motion? Uh, it's probably too late now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, for the record, Kim... What we just showed there is that a clear majority of the participants at the forum indicated a preference for buddy diving when using a rebreather. But it is also clear that a significant proportion of the uh, forum participants uh, believe that you can dive solo, but not necessarily that you should dive solo. That would be my interpretation of what I just saw there. Good, thank you, Simon. Martin? Well, it remains to me to close a meeting, which I will do shortly. But first of all, a, a few words uh, to the speakers. Uh, thank you, thank you, and thank you. I, this wouldn't have been possible without you. Uh, I appreciate uh, your putting up with uh, some harassment from me on occasion. 
Um, that's not yet done, actually. Uh, if you would, please submit your manuscript to me within uh, three months. That would be the 8th of August. And there'll be an email with specifics. I know not all the speakers are here, but a couple things I wanted to point out. Uh, you are not limited in your manuscript by either the, uh, just to what you said, and in particular, as a number of people have remarked, you know, I've learned so much here that will have, would have affected what I would have said. I'd like to put that in the manuscript. Please do so. That way, the, the proceedings will be more than just what has been said here, and it will be more useful uh, for us all in, in the future. Uh, now, uh, we've had a, a court reporter who's taking down uh, all our our words, and that will be provided, the transcript of that will be provided to assist you. And, and there will also be some editorial comments on, your, on the manuscripts you, uh, you submit. So we'll, we'll have a back and forth. Uh, a, a number of people uh, who will be working as editors will, will look things over, and perhaps we'll have some su suggestions. Uh, the goal would be to have the proceedings out by the end of the year. So on, on behalf uh, uh, of AUS, Dan, Patty, uh, a few more thank yous. Uh, specifically to Noah, I don't think Noah was recognized as a supporter, and it was, and, and certainly that was a, was a very important uh, part of the uh, of, uh, of support. To Patty, uh, personnel, Donna Zua, Adrian Miller, Janelle Hamm, Dan Makem, Tom Nedlick, Nicole Sherman, thank you all for serving as room captains. That was that was wonderful, and uh, the folks from from Dan and and Duke, Mitch Mackey, Jenna Wiley, Gene Hobbs, and Dr. Don Canegas. Thank you all, and Kim, thank you for taking notes. That was that's very very important, and thank you all for coming and participating and listening and commenting. Have a good trip home, and Rebreather Forum 3 is now closed. See you in 16 years. <laughs>